Welcome to this lecture on conflict classification. Today we will discuss two special cases. First, the situation of a foreign intervention, and second, the spillover of a non-international armed conflict. At the end of this lecture, we will also touch upon situations which do not reach the threshold of an armed conflict. There are only two categories of conflict covered by IHL, international armed conflicts on the one hand and non-international armed conflicts on the other. There are nevertheless situations where a non-international armed conflict can turn into an international armed conflict under specific circumstances. You may have noticed that with the growing number of non-international armed conflicts after World War II, it has become a recurring phenomenon that third states are intervening in civil wars. These third states intervene either on behalf of the ruling government or in order to support the rebel groups with the intention to overthrow the respective government in power. One recent example is how Russia continues to support Syrian armed forces at the request of President Assad in his fight against several rebel groups. We might also think further back to when the United States supported the Contra rebels in Nicaragua against the Nicaraguan armed forces of the Sandinista regime in the 1980s or we can consider the possible involvement of Russia in the conflict in eastern Ukraine between the Ukrainian armed forces and pro-Russian rebels. Finally, we could think of how the French Air Force has attacked ISIS fighters in Raqqa, Syria. Does foreign intervention change the character, in other words, the classification of a conflict? Where a state intervenes in support of the territorial government's battle against a rebellion in that country, such as the case of Russia operating in Syria, the conflict remains non-international in nature. But when a third intervening state supports the rebels against the territorial state, such as was the case in the United States operating in Nicaragua, the situation might actually change the conflict's classification. In this case, a conflict has the potential to become international if the intervening state exercises a certain amount of control over the rebels. The International Court of Justice, in its famous 1986 Nicaragua judgment, stated that for this to happen, the third state needs to have effective control over the rebel group. This means that third states must give clear instructions to the respective rebel group. In this Nicaragua case, the judges of the International Court of Justice ruled that the United States did not exercise effective control over the rebels in Nicaragua as it had merely provided training and financial support to these rebels. As a result, the conflict in Nicaragua remained a civil war and thus non-international in nature. However, it is questionable whether effective control is the decisive criterion today for classifying such conflicts. This is because the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia used a different test in its well-known 1999 Tadic Appeals Judgment. Instead of effective control, the tribunal applied the less demanding overall control standard with regards to organised armed groups in order to assess whether the conflict in Bosnia-Herzegovina had changed as a result of Serbia's influence on the Bosnian Serbs. The tribunal ruled that the overall control test was fulfilled because the Serbian government provided financial and operational support to the organised armed group of the Bosnian Serbs and helped them with the coordination and general planning of their military activities. As a result of the application of this lower threshold of overall control, the civil war in Bosnia-Herzegovina transformed into an international arms conflict between Bosnia-Herzegovina and Serbia. This divergence of jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice and the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia created some controversy amongst international academics and practitioners. Still, the overall control standard seems to have been accepted in the meantime as the decisive criterion for the characterization of armed conflicts and has been repeatedly confirmed by other courts and tribunals, such as the International Criminal Court in the Banga case. Now we would like to introduce you to another special situation, that of a non-international armed conflict which spills over into a neighboring country. Let us imagine that a civil war is being fought in the Netherlands between the Dutch armed forces and a rebel group which wants to become independent from the Netherlands and intends to join Belgium. One day, some of these rebels take refuge in Belgium 
and the armed forces of the Netherlands start to attack these rebels. Can this so-called Nyak spillover turn the underlying situation into an international armed conflict between the Netherlands and Belgium? If Belgium consents to the armed activities of the Dutch armed forces on its territory, Belgium would have to be considered part of the conflict between the Netherlands and the rebels and would be supporting the Netherlands. In this case, the conflict would remain non-international in character since it would not be fought between two states. If, on the other hand, Belgium does not provide its consent, the extraterritorial operations by the Netherlands on foreign territory may be characterised as an international armed conflict, even in cases where the attacks are not directly aimed at Belgian government buildings or agencies. At least this reasoning follows the 2016 edition of the official commentary of the International Committee of the Red Cross on the First Geneva Convention. Finally, we would like to discuss situations which fall below the threshold of armed conflict. The consequence of the relatively strict organisation and intensity requirements for the existence of a non-international armed conflict under Common Article 3 is that all situations which fall below this threshold are not covered by international humanitarian law. Rather, in these situations, we are faced with matters of law enforcement which in most cases are governed by the domestic legal regime and international human rights law. This viewpoint is further supported by Additional Protocol 2. If we look at Article 1, Paragraph 2, we can see that this protocol shall not apply to situations of internal disturbances and tensions, such as riots, isolated and sporadic acts of violence, and other acts of a similar nature as not being armed conflicts. This could mean that attacks from terrorists or attacks against possible terrorist suspects are not covered by the law of armed conflict when they only happen sporadically and are not linked to an armed conflict. To wrap up, in this video we discussed two special situations governed by IHL, namely foreign intervention and Nyack spillover. We discovered that a third state might intervene in a non-international armed conflict and that this can internationalise the conflict depending on the type of control exercised by the intervening state. We saw that the NIAC can spill over, thereby turning into an international armed conflict. This is important because the rules applicable to IACs are far more extensive. Finally, we notice that some situations are not regulated by international humanitarian law, such as riots and sporadic terrorist acts, and that domestic law and human rights law usually apply to these situations.